Uh, we are 14 then. I think that we can start with the the, the, the introduction. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, very well. Thank you, Brian, for accepting invitation. Uh, so let me uh, give a little bit of a, uh, an introduction uh, about Brian. So Brian is um, a theoretical astrophysics at the University of Columbia. His main interests lie in birds and deaths of compact objects. He received his PhD in 2009 from UC Berkeley. After that, as uh, a NASA Einstein Fellowship to Princeton, and in 2013, he moved to Columbia University where he's a full tenure professor. He holds a half-time senior research scientist position in the Center of Computational Astrophysics at Flat Iron Institute. And his work on neutron star mergers has played an important role in interpreting the electromagnetic signal which accompanied the first merger detected via gravitational waves, for which he received the New Horizons Breakthrough Prize and the Puno Ross Prize at the American uh, Academy. Sure Brian has is. also worked uh, on supernova, fast radio bursts, thermonuclear explosions on white dwarfs, and the destruction of stars by no, no, no. So, without further ado, please, Brian, if you can give us your presentation. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Yeah. Thank, thank you for in inviting me uh, remotely. I uh, have to come in person sometime. I hope everybody can hear me. I'll try Hopefully. to speak loudly. Um, and I, I hear, yeah, I hear some people, so maybe uh, those can mute that. that, that um, and if you have a question, you know, uh, of clarification in particular, you know, feel free to interrupt me. If it's a longer question, uh, deeper in nature, maybe we, we can wait till the end, but it, it's really up to you. Um, so I think everyone here, uh, it, it's really challenging, by the way, to give this talk where I can't get any reactions of anybody and see your faces. So um, so I apologize uh, uh, if it seems a bit out of sorts. And I suspect many of you have heard um, quite a bit about uh, LIGO's neutron star merger. Um, but nevertheless, I, I want to give you my take on this event because it may differ from what you hear from uh, a number of, of people. Um, and what I'm going to emphasize is how this merger is teaching us new things about a number of topics, uh, the origin of the elements, uh, potentially about the uh, interiors of neutron stars, um, and how it's really the prototype, I hope, for what are many more of these multi-messenger events where we can combine electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations um, uh, to, to learn something about physics, but also just, you know, the incredibly rich phenomenology of these mergers, which of course has been the work of, of many, uh, many people over many decades, which is in some ways this event is a culmination, but it's also, I think, uh, a gateway hopefully to, to a, a new era where, where we, we are able to, to make use of gravitational waves. So uh, with that, let me just get started. So, uh, when I was uh, entering graduate school in the early 2000s, um, this was the sort of textbook. Uh, if you saw uh, uh, the periodic table and where we thought, you know, the elements come from in nature, this was sort of the, the textbook uh, uh, figure you would see. And of course, you know, one of the goals of nuclear astrophysics is to identify where and when all these elements are created. Um, so the lightest elements, of course, were mostly forged in the Big Bang. Um, the intermediate mass elements um, were formed uh, inside of uh, massive stars, most of them, and, and ejected into space when those stars explode at the end of their lives as supernova. And, you know, um, you know, and, and, and I think we, we know this, you know, quote unquote, know this because we actually see these supernova events directly polluting the interstellar medium with these heavy elements. So this is a famous uh, picture of Cass A which exploded about 350 years ago. It's somewhat debated, but it may have been the last, you know, galactic naked eye supernova, the original star being thought to be around 17 solar masses that exploded. And when you look at the X-ray emission uh, from this shock heated gas, different X-ray energies are essentially showing you um, different elements that were produced. And so, you know, this is really the basis for this famous Carl Sagan quote about the calcium in our teeth and the iron in our blood and the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interior of collapsing stars. When we say we're made of star stuff, you know, we can directly see it. It's, it's, it's a, you know, very uh, clear 
um, that this is the correct explanation uh, for the origin of the lighter elements. Uh, but as we get to the bottom of the periodic table, the element's heavier than iron, um, and this includes the you know, precious metals and the transuranic elements. We've, we've struggled for a long time to uh, identify where these elements come from. Um, uh, because we don't think they can be formed in, inside the interiors of ordinary stars. Um, and the problem is essentially as follows. So, so um, you know, uh, uh, iron is roughly, you know, equal numbers of, of neutrons and protons. If you want to form something heavier than iron, you have a prodigious Coulomb barrier to overcome to, to synthesize, bring those nuclei together and, and forge them together. Um, and if you got so hot to actually create these heavier elements, it would be so hot you'd essentially dissociate them. It's also not energetically favored. Um, so, so in principle, it's, it's easy. Uh, this is an old problem. How do you turn uh, iron into gold? Uh, in principle, it's easy. You just bombard an iron nucleus. Uh, you, you avoid the Coulomb barrier altogether by bombarding an iron nucleus at a very high rate with uh, neutrons. And in this way, um, you can form a very heavy but initially unstable isotope, uh, which once it decays can, can then form gold. Uh, but then the question of uh, switches, it's, it's, it's no longer how do I form gold? We think this forms through this process, process of rapid neutron capture. Uh, the question is, where do I find a high enough density of neutrons in nature um, that I can actually bombard a nucleus faster than it beta, can beta decay? And this, this rapid neutron capture process is necessary to explain about half of the elements heavier than iron. So some site in nature which has a very high density uh, of, of neutrons for potentially a short period of time is, is the source of these heaviest elements. And of course, the obvious site you go to is a, a neutron star because, you know, th that's a, nor, nor, you know, the, the challenge, of course, a neutron in free space decays into a proton in 15 minutes, but inside of a neutron star, it's stable. So neutron stars are these nice capsules for, for containing a lot of neutrons, which uh, if subsequently dispersed into space in an explosive event, could be a site for producing these heaviest elements. And I'm not the expert on this. Next, Danny Page uh, is the expert on the line here about what's inside of a neutron star. Um, but I will say, you know, this is this is another obvious open question. If you want to merge two neutron stars together, you have to know, you know, what they're what they're made of. What's the equation of state at nuclear and, and supernuclear densities? And we're still debating exactly what the nuclear physics is there, but a given equation of state, of course, predicts a relationship between the uh, masses and radii of neutron stars um, track like this. We're still debating whether the radius is, you know, 10 or 11 kilometers or 13. As I'll talk about later, these, there's, there's starting to be some constraints on this that, that we're producing. Um, and uh, of course, the equation of state also has to support uh, massive neutron stars because we now have mass neutron stars with masses greater than, you know, at least two or maybe even 2.1 solar masses. Um, and so, you know, that put places an additional constraint on the, the pressure of nuclear matter at the highest densities um, that we have to have a star which is able to be stable up to these masses where we've measured uh, neutron stars. Um, um, so I think we're all aware that if you get two of these neutron stars together in a binary, that that's the source of uh, a time-dependent quadrupole moment of inertia, which really really results in the emission of gravitational waves, which carries away angular momentum and energy from the binary and causes the binary to inspiral over time. And this produces uh, a gravitational wave signal, which increases in frequency and amplitude, uh, known as the chirp, because that's what it would sound like, a chirp. You could hear it audially. Um, and of course, LIGO has detected uh, these gravitational waves from, from many um, uh, binary black hole mergers, um, but uh, and that's what for which they won the Nobel Prize. But uh, it wasn't until August of 2017 that they detected uh, their first uh, neutron star merger candidate, uh, 170817. And they don't measure the masses of the individual neutron stars particularly well. But one thing they do measure well because it's tightly related to the chirp mass, which controls the phase of of, of the gravitational wave signal, is the total mass of the binary. So they measured the total mass of this system to be about 2.7 uh, solar masses, which is um, smack dab in the middle of, if you look at the galactic binary neutron star distribution, this is this total mass is very uh, typical of, of the galactic binary neutron stars. And most of those are equal mass binaries, I should just say up front. So my, my personal view is this was a very, you know, vanilla event. It would have it would have naively been what we would expect it to detect as the first neutron star in terms of its properties. Um, and my guess is these were fairly uh, equal mass neutron stars if, if our galactic ones are representative. 
So um, as you're also probably aware, by measuring the arrival time of the gravitational waves uh, at the LIGO detectors in North America and the Virgo detector in Italy, uh, they were able to triangulate the arrival time on the sky it was over the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, other side of the Earth. Um, um, and so basically, uh, this uh, instigated a worldwide campaign to do an electromagnetic uh, follow-up of this discovery with telescopes on the ground in space. Um, so that, I mean, this is roughly the, the timeline that, that went down uh, following that discovery in, in August 2017. Um, so the first thing that happened was there was a burst of gamma rays that were detected by the Fermi satellite and also by uh, the Integral satellite, uh, which localized it to this region of the sky. Then a few hours later, LIGO uh, finalized its air regions. Um, there, there's some degeneracy on the sky when you just have two detectors, and so it was either here or here, but thanks to the Virgo detector in Italy, they were able to further localize it to this region. And then within that part of the sky, there were uh, only a handful of galaxies out to the, to the distance inferred from the gravitational waves. And essentially, astronomers systematically looked at all these galaxies, and they found um, the fading uh, counterpart in this galaxy, NGC 4993, at about 40 megaparsecs. So you know, as we know, that's basically right in our backyard. We certainly didn't expect the first neutron star merger to be, to be so close. Uh, you know, LIGO had sensitivity to see this event twice as far away. So it's quite a pleasant surprise. It was, it was so nearby, this first event. And what the uh, optical telescopes found was a fading uh, flare of light uh, that was unlike that we had been observed before. Uh, we see supernova all the time, but they, don't, de they aren't uh, decaying this quickly. There are events called nova, which decay uh, this quickly, but they're not nearly as bright as this event. So it's truly unique uh, in its properties, this, this uh, optical and, and infrared uh, transient we saw from this event. And I guess the rest of my talk is to convey that, um, you know, how we sort of immediately understood what we were seeing from that event uh, and what it's you know, telling us about uh, the neutron star merger. So I have to step back a second and talk about some of the different pathways um, some of the different outcomes that you can get um, from two neutron stars merging. Um, and the outcome depends most sensitively, in my viewpoint, on two properties. Uh, one is the total mass of the ingoing binary, which, as I mentioned earlier, LIGO can measure reasonably accurately. Um, and the other is the TOV mass, the maximum mass of a non-rotating, you know, cold neutron star, which is, is some proxy for the stiffness of the equation of state, at, you know, albeit at zero temperature, but you know, these things don't get incredibly hot. So, so you have this critical ratio, basically the total mass to the TOV mass, and depending on this, you have different outcome possibilities. And this is based on numerical relativity simulations. I'm just going to tell you the answer of these different outcomes. Um, so what numerical relativity simulations show is that if the total mass of the binary exceeds about 30 to 60% above the TOV mass, that the outcome of the merger is a prompt collapse to a black hole. Now, this 30 to 60 percent threshold depends on the compactness of the neutron star, um, and it, it's still being worked out. It's a little bit rough, but but uh, in this case, because you form a black hole promptly, there's relatively little in the way of mass ejection from the system. There probably is a little bit, but it, overall, it's a fairly uh, dim event, and it's over pretty quickly. What happens, we think, more frequently is that the mass is not this large um, because we have some constraints on the, the TOV mass. Um, and so the outcome of the merger is instead the formation of a temporarily stable object, which is stabilized by its, you know, rapid rotation. Essentially, the centrifugal forces are temporarily stabilizing it against uh, collapse. Uh, but the object is uh, differentially rotating. Um, and as angular momentum is transferred, uh, f if, basically, the angular momentum is redistributed in this object following the merger. And this pushes angular momentum out and mass inwards. And at some point, the object becomes unstable and collapses into a black hole. Um, this it, uh, time scale is uncertain because it depends on what is the form of internal viscosity. Is it MHD? Is it related to gravitational waves? But in essence, um, you know, the, the main difference is that there's a delay before the black hole is formed. And as a result of the transfer of angular momentum outwards, you end up with a much more massive uh, torus around the black hole, which is important for the electromagnetic counterparts I'll talk about in a second. There's a third possibility, which is that even once this object has accreted all the mass and come into solid body rotation, uh, 
uh, it still may not collapse into a black hole. It still may be stabilized by its uh, rapid rotation. Um, um, if this process roughly conserves angular momentum, but in this process, you know, if, if, you've, if you've entered solid body rotation and you still haven't collapsed, that's possible for uh, sufficiently low mass binaries uh, up to about 20% above the TOB mass. And we call those objects supramassive neutron stars. And they actually have to lose angular momentum in bulk uh, to form a black hole. And that could take considerably longer. For instance, it could be the magnetic dipole spin down time of the neutron star, uh, which could be you know, minutes or hours or, or weeks, depending on the strength of the magnetic field. Um, um, and so you, know, you have at least, the main point I want to emphasize here is we have at least three distinct outcomes of a merger for fairly modest changes of the ingoing parameters of the binary. Um, you know, 20%, 10% changes in this quantity can, can potentially lead to orders of magnitude difference in the lifetime of, of the remnant. And so the, the sort of name of the game, in my view, is that LIGO and Virgo tell us what's going in, um, and then we try to infer electromagnetically what happened, uh, test this uh, scenario, and if we see something fishy, maybe that's telling us that either our simulations are wrong or they're missing important physics. A lot of this is based on, you know, equations of state that don't have uh, 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 phase transitions, for instance. There could be some, you know, so if we see, you know, this is sort of the, the vanilla expectation. And if we see deviations from this, uh, it could teach us some important things. So what I'm going to try to argue to you is I think it's very likely uh, that 17817 went through this intermediate phase. And, and this was sort of what we expected. Uh, was the most likely outcome uh, ahead of time. So here I'm showing you a simulation of two merging neutron stars. This is not my own work. This is the work of uh, David Radice and collaborators. Uh, but you're just seeing the final stages of the two stars. Uh, near the end, they start to become strongly tidally deformed. There's mass ejection in the form of, of, of tidal material, which comes out of the equatorial plane. The two stars smash together. There's a lot of shock heated material, which comes out uh, over a wider range of solid angles. And at the end, you have this hypermassive neutron star surrounded by a, a disk, and then eventually it collapses. Uh, in this case, due to the loss of, of angular momentum from gravitational waves, it collapses into a black hole. But you're surrounded by a, a, a torus around the, the newly formed black hole. Um, I think you probably also heard of this from this from, from William, since he's worked quite a bit on these, these binaries over the years. Um, uh, so what kinds of electromagnetic uh, counterparts uh, would you would you see uh, from these mergers? Well, I think that the, the lore is that it's a very sensitive function of your viewing angle with respect to the binary axis, or equivalently with respect to, to the jet axis, angle momentum of, of the disk in these systems should be lined with uh, orbital angle momentum. So the idea has been around, you know, for, for many decades, um, that if you are within the opening angle of, of so basically the accretion process produces uh, a relativistic jet and some sort of internal dissipation in that jet produces gamma rays. And the idea has been around for a while that if you're within the opening angle of the jet, you should see a really bright burst of gamma rays. And this is the leading model for the cosmological short gamma ray bursts. From this event, we weren't necessarily within the opening angle of the jet. We were about 25 degrees off the axis. But as you're aware, we nevertheless did see a burst of gamma rays. Um, and intriguingly, uh, they were delayed by about two seconds with respect to the to the termination of the in spiral. And so there's been a lot of questions about what caused this uh, delay in the arrival of the gravitational uh, of the gamma rays. Um, assuming it's not some kind of fundamental physics issue related to the speed of, of light relative to gravitational waves, um, I, you know, I think there's a few possibilities. One is that it actually took two seconds after the merger for the black hole to form, assuming a, a black hole is needed to make the jet. Another possibility um, is that the jet had, and I, this is my preferred one, is that the jet formed fairly early, the black hole formed fairly early, uh, but it has to break out of this cloud of debris that was ejected when the neutron stars collide, and the cloud itself is almost moving out at the speed of light. So the jet has to, has to catch up to, to, to break out of the cloud. And there could also be a propagation effect, you know, between where the, the, the the jet has to break out, and and and, um, and 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 the gravitational waves, which come directly directly to us, or geometric uh, delay. So, so anyways, people are still trying to understand this, uh, and it's teaching us quite a bit about the structure of these jets. Um, and and I think this fact that we're seeing it, you know, off axis is consistent with the fact that it was quite a bit substantially less luminous than the uh, cosmological gamma ray bursts. And and what the the emission mechanism responsible for the gamma rays may very well be. Uh, 
uh, different. It may be something more akin to a shock breakout than a uh, sort of internal dissipation in, in a jet, which is the usual picture for GRBs. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the GRB in this talk. Um, there's been a lot of work on this. The afterglow, X-ray radio afterglow has confirmed that there was, in fact, a very powerful off-axis jet uh, from this event that we, we didn't see its gamma ray emission from, but we can infer uh, it, did, it, did, it, it was produced uh, uh, with properties consistent with uh, those observed for cosmological GRBs. What I'm talking about more in this talk is the more isotropic signal, uh, which is not relativistically beamed and is not produced by the fastest material, but rather by the, the, the slower material that's uh, ejected uh, across a wider range of angles and as it decompresses forms these uh, heavy R process elements and produces a thermal transient, which I'll refer to as the, the kilonova. So the basic motivation here is that there are several sources of neutron rich uh, ejecta during the merger. Um, as a function of time after the, the coalescence. And so let me go through some of these different sources of ejecta. Um, so so the, the first ones are, you know, the, the tidal material, the material that's stripped off uh, from the strong tidal forces uh, near the end of the in-spiral. When the two stars collide together, there's some shock heated material, which, which comes out um, also into the polar direction. I refer to these as dynamical because they uh, come off on a dynamical time, you know, just a few orbits near the end. Um, there's not uh, as much of it. So, so the estimates from the current simulations suggest it can range from maybe a thousandth of a solar mass, optimistically, maybe a hundredth of a solar mass. And it tends to uh, come out with a fairly high velocity. Um, there's a second source of ejecta, which comes out over uh, longer periods of time. And these are outflows from the accretion disk that formed around the black hole. So this is, you know, called sometimes called the secular ejecta because it comes out over a time scale which is um, related to the lifetime of the accretion disk, which can be, you know, up to seconds or longer. Um, and 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 they'll talk about there can be substantially more mass in in these outflows, um, and it tends to come off with a somewhat lower speed than this dynamical material. Um, and so there's really a rich range of different forms of ejection different exposures of this material to neutrinos, um, which is important because, um, you know, what's going to matter in a second is how neutron rich this material is. And neutrinos can turn, even though the material inside the neutron star and inside this accretion disk is very neutron rich, neutrinos can turn neutrons back into protons. And so one of the important um, uncertainties here is how long this central neutron star survives before it collapses into a black hole. Um, and we think the longer it survives, basically the less neutron rich these, these outflows will be because um, the disk is irradiated not just by neutrinos that are created in the disk itself, but by this central neutron star remnant, which is an extremely powerful source of neutrinos. So, so uh, some of what I'll talk about later is the sensitivity of the out, outflows uh, and their implications uh, depending on the lifetime of the remnant and how we can maybe turn the problem around to try to infer the lifetime of the remnant from what we see um, coming out. So the main point uh, with these accretion disk outflows is that, um, you know, these black holes that are accreting high, you know, well above the Eddington uh, rate are, tend to be uh, fussy eaters, um, by which I mean, uh, so this is some GRMHD simulations of these accretion disks we did with Daniel Siegel uh, others, such as William, have been working on these, uh, and, and Rodrigo Fernandez, with, with hydro simulations for, for many years. Um, uh, and I guess what I would say is, um, uh, you know, these disks are creating at such a high rate that in the midplane of the disk, uh, they can efficiently cool through neutrino emission. So they're thin in the some sense, but then when you get out of the midplane where the temperatures are lower and where a lot of the MHD turbulence is, is, is deposited, um, uh, in these regions, uh, it, the, 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 uh, the disk can't cool. And so it's very susceptible to, to driving a wind through what I refer to as coronal heating. It's basically dissipation of turbulence in the, in the coronal regions. And uh, this in combination with alpha particle recombination, which also gives the outflows a boost, results in a significant fraction of the accretion disk not making it into the horizon, but instead uh, coming out in these winds. And with Daniel, we estimated that about 30% of the torus will be unbound uh, uh, in these outflows. And so if you have a tenth of a solar mass torus, uh, 
which is very typical if you go through a hypermassive neutron star phase, you could easily have, you know, three tenths of a solar mass, uh, sorry, three hundredths of a solar mass uh, or more uh, in ejecta from these winds. Um, um, and so this is quite a bit more than we expect to come out dynamically usually. So as this material expands from the accretion disk into space, it decompresses from enormously high densities and temperatures. It starts off with, you know, many millions of degrees temperature, but as it decompresses, the neutrons and protons get together and form alpha particles, which then form, uh, very quickly form seed nuclei. But those seed nuclei are, are embedded in a sea of neutrons because the matter is so new, neutron rich. And so as the matter expands, the, your, your nuclei capture neutrons, and it's in this manner that you're able to form uh, very heavy elements in the ejected material. So here I'm showing you a, nu uh, a nuclear reaction network, an R-process network. On this axis is the proton number. On this axis is the neutron number. We're following a single fluid element as it expands away from, the, say, the accretion disk or in the dynamical material. So this is the temperature and density, and they will drop uh, monotonically with time. And so you start off as you expand, you're initially in nuclear statistical equilibrium under these conditions. Um, so you have an island of nuclei that are just a little bit heavier than iron. Um, but then as, uh, you know, as you proceed, you capture neutrons, which moves you this way. And then eventually uh, you become less stable and you undergo beta decays. And so it's a subsequent sequence of neutron captures and beta decays that allows you to move up to these heavier elements. So I'll run the movie. Um, so yeah, we're decompressing now, temperature and density are dropping. Uh, we're moving up and forming these heavier elements. You can see a running account of the uh, composition versus atomic mass number up here. And after about a second, we run out of neutrons and then everything slowly decays back to the valley of stable nuclei over time scales of days, weeks, months, uh, years, et cetera. Um, and it's in this way, if we have enough neutrons in the outflow that we're able to uh, create these heaviest elements. Um, now, exactly the abundance distribution that is produced depends sensitively on uh, the composition of the ejected material. It's, it's so-called electron fraction. And it also depends sensitively on a lot of nuclear physics over here that is, is not experimentally measured yet and, and not theoretically certain. Um, so we, we should not expect, you know, given all these simplifications, exact agreement with, for instance, the R process in our, on the sun um, but you reproduce this, you know, the right qualitative features provided that the outflows have enough neutrons to uh, capture their way uh, all the way up here. So the important point for the kilonova is that these isotopes you create are uh, radioactive. Um, and this is important because um, as the matter is expanding, it, it would normally be adiabatically cooling. But because of this heating from radioactivity, it keeps the matter hot. And, and shining bright, um, even despite these adiabatic losses. So this is showing you from, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the radioactive power versus time for some fiducial assumptions. Um, so in Norman Airy supernova, the main radioactive isotope that's powering the light curve is nickel 56. So nickel produces a constant radioactive heating followed by an exponential decay to cobalt. Uh, which then exponentially decays. But here you have hundreds of isotopes with a variety of different half-lives. So the ones with shorter half-lives decay into ones with longer half-lives. And when you add them in aggregate, you get um, uh, a radioactive heating rate, which is something that goes more like a power law uh, in time, roughly t to the minus 1.3 for if beta decays dominate. Um, and the key window where you care about this radioactive heating is about a few hours to a few weeks uh, after the merger, because prior to this time, uh, you release a lot of heating, but the ejecta is opaque, so it just absorbs that and, and loses it to, to PDV work. But after a few hours, the ejecta is becoming transparent, and so this energy you're releasing can actually diffuse out and be observable. Um, and so we were uh, the first in 2010 to really emphasize that this is something one can calculate, not just guess. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and to quantify this, which, which is important because it controls how bright these transients are going to get for a given amount of material. Um, so, so the key thing is that the visual luminosity of the merger uh, days after will be proportional to the mass of these synthesized elements. Um, so these were the predictions we made in 2010 for what the light curves of these. This was using a, a, a simple... Uh, 1D Monte Carlo radiative transfer, but in, including uh, the radioactive heating from the R process. Uh, 
So this is luminosity versus time. And what we found was if you have, you know, a hundredth of a solar mass expanding at a tenth the speed of light, that the predicted light curve would be about a, a few 10 to the 41, 10 to the 42 ergs per second. Uh, this was a thousand times uh, brighter than a nova. So we called these a kilonova. And then after you reach the peak, which is set by diffusion, you, you basically follow the radioactive heating uh, like this a after that point. Um, and so it was really impressive or, or, or incredible for me uh, when the data came back on the telescope uh, to basically see that the light curves essentially tracked uh, this type of behavior uh, in the uh, week following discovery. And even more ironically, I didn't have to change our very first model uh, at all uh, <laughs> uh, to fit the data. This is just coincidental because th this model didn't account for the inefficiency of thermalization um, which makes it brighter than it should be, but then we also took less ejecta mass than what was inferred. So it, it was sort of a coincidence, but uh, it worked out beautifully. So this was very exciting because it was the direct uh, first direct observation of our process production. This was proposed by uh, uh, Latimer and Schramm in the 70s that mergers were an important source of our process. Um, and you know, this is the final of the of the Burbage, Burbage, Hoyle, and Fowler, uh, you know. Uh, site of the elements that we really hadn't pinned down. Um, and so it's very exciting to directly see the production of these elements. Um, I'll come back a little later, some other evidence of this. But basically, um, we know... Wait, wait. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just a quick, so the previous slide that you were showing that was theory, yeah, this one. So what what GRP was this then? Is this the 170817 or which Yeah, this is 170817. This is just uh, the optical luminosity that they saw, yeah. Okay, but there were there were previous kilonovas that were seen, right? Um, there were hints, yes. So there were there was a single data point for a GRB kilonova. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. So this okay. was the first one where uh, the afterglow didn't outshine the kilonovas, so we could actually see because the jet was pointed a different way, we could actually see this whole behavior. Um, for this event, yes, yes. Okay. So, I was just wondering with the previous kilonova if you could see your theory versus data, but if it was just one point then. <laughs> yeah, it was just one point, um, but it's true. There were ones before, um, and, and, they, and, they, and also one can only look in very red bands. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but there was, there was hints of this before. And cool. actually looking back there, I worked on a GRB in 2008 with Dan Purley, 080503, which had a light curve that looked quite a bit like this. Um, and actually working at the time, it wasn't sure if it was a kilonova or a weird afterglow. Um, uh, but actually working on that event in 28 actually spurred me to do these calculations. So, uh, uh, so, so it was anyways, it was, it, yeah, there were hints before, uh, okay. maybe some other cases. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So, um, so to explain, uh, uh, all of the, uh, our process in the galaxy, um, you need a production rate of our process isotopes, which is roughly 10 to the minus six per year, averaged over the age of the Milky Way. And we now uh, know from LIGO, this is actually old, I didn't update this, but we know from LIGO the rate of binary neutron star mergers in the universe, and hence the equivalent Milky Way rate. We now have some constraint on it. Um, and so you can ask the question, you know, how much our process would each neutron star merger that we think happens in Milky Way type galaxies have to produce in order to produce, say, all of the R process in, in the galaxy. And you need each merger, depending on what the rate turns out to be, it's actually now on the low end. So we actually need the higher end here. So you need about a hundredth of a solar mass, maybe a little more per merger, if you wanted to explain um, all of it through these. And um, as I'll talk about in a second, by modeling this event, um, we were able to infer that this single event produced several hundredths, we think, of a solar mass uh, of material. So it does seem like there may be enough R process um, being produced by the mergers, uh, assuming it produces the right abundance pattern, just in sort of a very rough sense, order of magnitude sense. It seems very likely that these mergers are an important source. Now, whether they're the dominant one, we're still debating. Um, there could be other sources like collapsars or things. But you know, it's, it's, it's clear from this event that we found a major source and, and that's very exciting. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a pretty good, you know, before I just showed you the bull metric luminosities and showed you, okay, the bull metric luminosities match some of these early models. 
Um, but there's an additional uh, feature of this event, which uh, was also thought about theoretically that was explained, um, which is the very strong color evolution. So it was very blue early on and very red later. And of course, many stellar explosions evolved from blue to red. But this evolution was was very extreme, starting off in the UV band and, and becoming uh, near infrared transient uh, after a few days. And in fact, that trend continues. There were Spitzer observations taken many months afterwards and show that it, there was flux in the in the almost to the mid infrared. So um, so what is explaining this this the colors of the kilonova? So what tells us the colors? Well, we think it's uh, con connected to the composition of the ejected material. Um, so this is showing you, um, so basically it comes down to what is the opacity of the ejecta, because that controls at what wavelength photons are able to diffuse out. Um, if you have just the lighter R processed elements, they're, um, relative, so, so they, they live in the, the, they have D shell valence electrons. Um, so they have an atomic structure, which in some sense is not too different than iron which is a half-shelled, you know, half-D-shelled uh, valence structure. Um, and so they have a lot of lines in the optical and UV, but not an overwhelmingly large number. And so if you assume the ejecta has just these light r process elements, what you predict is that um, the transient should peak uh, about a day after the merger, uh, and it will be fairly blue in its colors. Um, um, on the other hand, it was pointed out by... Um, Dan Kaysen and Jennifer Barnes, um, and also independently by Hota Kazaka and Tanaka, um, that if you have uh, lanthanides in the ejecta, so the very bottom of the periodic table, uh, they have uh, F-shell valence electrons. And so their atomic structure is in some sense much more complex than say an iron nucleus or the lighter R process elements. And because they have a more complex atomic structure, they have many more transitions in the UV and optical which basically block out all of the UV and optical light and all of the energy has to diffuse out in the near infrared. So if you have a lot of, or even a modest amount of these lanthanides, you, you, you go from predicting a fast peaking blue thing to something which is peaking more on a time scale of a week uh, and is substantially redder due to the high opacity of these lanthanides. So kilonova colors, we think, tell us something about whether the ejecta has lanthanides or no lanthanides. And this, in turn, is related to um, how many neutrons were in the ejecta. Because as I mentioned earlier, if the, if the ejecta is very neutron rich, you can form the heaviest elements, like the lanthanides. If it's not, you're going to stop at the later R process elements. What we saw from this event was both. We saw something that was very blue initially and became very red later times. Um, and I will call this the blue and the red kilonova. We actually saw both from this first event. And um, this was actually something we had also given some thought to as well, um, because there are different sources of mass ejection during the merger, and they have different composition of the ejecta, and they should form different elements. Um, in particular, we know, for instance, when the two neutron stars collide, they produce um, a, 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 a polar ejecta that tends to have a high electron fraction, doesn't tend to be particularly neutron rich, and shouldn't form the heaviest elements. But this nevertheless may be what you see first if you're viewing the event up here. You may see this fairly neutron poor material which has been uh, shock heated and irradiated by neutrinos uh, ejected in this direction. But then you have outflows that occur later either from, well, maybe they occur promptly from the tidal tail or maybe they're outflows from the accretion disk after the black hole is formed and there are less neutrinos around. And we think that this material would be more neutron rich because it's less exposed to neutrinos and it could produce the heaviest elements. And so this could produce something that peaks later, uh, a red kilonova. And so this is literally a figure from our paper that there would be a, a blue and a red component. And this is kind of what we saw from this event and how we modeled this event. Um, there are many groups that have modeled this event using more sophisticated techniques there's still a lot of uncertainty in how to do the radio transport with all these different components. But if you model it as two spherical cows, one embedded inside of another, what you, you can get a reasonably good fit to the photometry of this event. As I mentioned, the blue bands decayed very quickly, and then the red bands were more persistent and extended to the infrared. Uh, 
what you find is that the blue component, the LIDAR process only component, you need maybe about a hundredth of the solar mass expanding with a high velocity. On the other hand, the bulk of the ejecta comes out in this redder, more neutron rich component, which we think also contains some lanthanides, maybe about four times as much mass and it has a lower velocity. And this is also consistent with the spectra. If you look at the spectra at early times when it's blue, the very broad lines, very high velocity, uh, whereas the whereas the spectral features, insofar as one can infer them, they're 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 difficult to to see, uh, are narrower um, at later times. Um, so we think we have a picture of this event as a sort of slow red kilonova embedded inside a, a faster blue kilonova. Um, and with a total ejecta mass of several hundreds of a solar mass. Um, so you can ask the question, the first order question you might ask is, well, where did these different ejecta components come from? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are, you know, material that's ejected dynamically during the merger itself. And there's material that comes out later in the form of accretion disk outflows. So what I'm showing you here is the ejecta velocity and ejecta mass of just what I'm showing with these points are just the dynamical material, because this is what people who do numerical GR simulations measure. They don't usually follow the disk long enough to measure this component. They just measure what comes off of their grid when the two neutron stars are still, you know, just merging. Um, and so they find that the dynamical material is fairly low in mass and, you know, has, has pretty high velocities. Whereas the two components of ejecta we inferred from the modeling a fast blue one and a low red one, they, they sort of sit here. Um, and so what you can see is that the blue one potentially could be consistent with the velocity and masses of the dynamical ejecta as predicted by numerical GR simulations, um, maybe. Uh, but the, the red one, the higher amount of mass, much lower speed just doesn't uh, uh, conform. And so my best guess is that this, uh, the dominant source of ejecta uh, was the accretion disk outflows because it, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it naturally produces the large amount of ejecta mass. And it, I didn't mention this, but we also get velocities from the accretion disk outflows, which are about a tenth the speed of light. Um, so my personal view is that most of the ejecta from 729817 came from the disk outflows. And then there's this blue component, which we don't really know the origin of, but it could possibly get a contribution from the dynamical material. And the sort of irony is that this has been the focus of the GR community, but in the case of this event, it may have been the subdominant component relative to the disk outflows. Um, so another thing I want to emphasize is that the colors of the kilonova, in principle, probe the time scale after the merger for a black hole to form. And it's for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, when you first have the merger, you, you first go through as a, as a hyper massive or supermassive neutron star phase where you have a central neutron star which is irradiating the accretion disks um, and as I mentioned earlier neutrinos can turn neutrons into protons and it can raise the electron fraction um, so 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 basically in order to get a blue kilonova you need an electron fraction larger than about 0.25 that's roughly the cutoff to have enough neutrons to get up to the lanthanides um, and below that you should you should produce a red kilonova if, if, if you're ejecting there and so this is showing you the electron fraction distribution of the accretion disk outflows in a case where we set up a disk around a neutron star, which we made a, basically a strong source of neutrinos by hand, but then we artificially collapse that neutron star to a black hole at different delays with respect to, to the merger. Um, and so what you see is if the neutron star collapses quickly, most of the ejecta is not exposed to neutrinos and uh, you will produce a red kilonova. But the longer the neutron star survives, the more it irradiates these, the, the disk. Basically, the disk is evaporating on its own accord, but it's being irradiated by the central light bulb of neutrinos. And so the longer it survives, the more of this blue kilonova ejecta you get. And so the prediction is we would have a, a basically the relative strength of the red and blue components um, you know, would tell us something about the lifetime of the remnant. If we have a prompt collapse with relatively little uh, mass ejection, little neutrino radiation, most of the uh, light we would get would be this red component and the blue component from the lighter R process would be suppressed uh, 
But as the neutron star survives 30 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, or even longer after the merger, the, the blue component will get uh, increasingly strong compared to the red one. And so I would argue the fact that we saw a dominant red component in 170817 is suggestive that the remnant did not survive a really long time after the merger. Um, it would just be hard to get such neutron poor material, neutron rich material out um, if you had a, a, a proto neutron star sitting there for a second. And there are other arguments which have been made for a black hole forming in this event to explain the GRB jet uh, by Ariadna, uh, Yanni Grano, and other people. So I, I think there's a, a tentative consensus that we likely did form a black hole in this event, but not everyone agrees with this. So, um, but I think there's a number of, of, let's say, indirect pieces of evidence pointing that direction. LIGO, by the way, can't tell us if a black hole formed or not. They don't have uh, sensitivity uh, to, 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 to the high frequencies they would need to see that. So going back to my new, neutron star merger pathways diagram, as I mentioned, LIGO and Virgo measured the binary mass for 72017 quite well. And then we can go through these possibilities and ask whether the observations favor them or not. So I would argue that the prompt collapse is uh, basically ruled out. We just, there's just too much mass ejection. Um, as I said, we, from the kilonova, we infer several hundreds of a solar mass. Uh, no prompt collapse simulation has ever given nearly that much mass ejection, even if the whole disk was ejected. So I think that's unlikely. Um, and uh, likewise, I think it's unlikely that we had a very long-lived neutron star remnant and the reason here is that this object should collapse to a black hole, but you have to remove quite an enormous amount of rotational energy from this object. I'll come back to this to collapse into a black hole. And if you add up, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but, but basically, basically the amount of energy that would be released by this, this magnetar to make a black hole is more than we infer from the kilonova from the GRB jet. And as I mentioned earlier, the kilonova is, is, I think, too red to be explained by an indefinitely stable remnant. So I think almost by process of elimination, um, I favor that this event did go through a hypermassive neutron star phase, but that it eventually collapsed into a black hole. Um, and so that's kind of interesting because it turns out that the prompt collapse threshold, as I mentioned, depends on the TOV mass and on the compactness of the neutron star. And the supermassive threshold mainly depends on the TOV mass um, so you can go back to this equation of state diagram, um, uh, which connects neutron star masses and radii and ask, you know, if I believe these constraints, if I take them literally without any systematic errors, uh, what parts of this parameter space can I, uh, rule out? And, um, oops. And, and so if you combine, uh, all the constraints from this event in a very non-Bayesian crude way, um, they look something like this. Uh, basically, the non-prompt collapse condition puts ends up, because it's putting a constraint basically on the compactness, it, it results in a lower limit on the neutron star radius. And so that's sort of here. There's a, a more, less conservative constraint from Redite, which is very related uh, here. Um, and then LIGO from the tidal deformability, which is a purely gravitational wave, related constraint. They come at it from above, something like this. And then I would argue that the, the fact that we didn't get a long-lived remnant, uh, because we measure the total mass and because uh, we say it did, that, that it did not form a long-lived remnant, you can put an upper limit on the TOV mass. And I would say that comes down, down to it from right here. Shibata has a slightly more conservative constraint, but it's around 2.2 solar masses or so. Um, and so it's quite interesting that this event, you know, alone would seem to tightly constrain the types of equations of state that are allowed. And I want to emphasize that um, with the exception of, of the title deformability one, this is a truly multi-messenger constraint because we're combining constraints that come uh, from electromagnetic observations, uh, inferring the remnant outcome and from gravitational wave observations of the, the total ingoing mass. So it's really, multi-messenger has turned into a kind of buzzword, but I think in this case, it's, it's appropriate. So the future in this area, as I think you're all aware, is very bright. We expect more mergers. We're probably going to avert events. So right now, we didn't get anything, unfortunately, in 03, partially because it was maybe because it was shut down early because of COVID. Um, but we didn't get any more electromagnetic counterparts. 
Uh, 04 is coming. Um, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll get more of these. We'll see some events similar to 17.017. Maybe viewed from, maybe we'll see something with the exact same chirp mass, but viewed from a different angle, and we'll be able to test some of these ideas. Maybe we'll see more massive binaries uh, that collapse into black holes faster. Maybe we'll see neutron star black hole mergers. And of course, uh, you know, Kagra in Japan, the Japanese detector, and, and LIGO is moving one of its observatories to India. So it should be very exciting. I want to spend just a few minutes uh, left to talk about a little bit of this kilonova diversity. Um, so the prediction is that if I have a more massive ingoing binary, I will collapse to a black hole faster. That will produce less ejection and it will be less irradiated by neutrinos. So all else being equal, I, we predict that this would produce a dimmer, redder kilonova. We had a potential chance to test this with LIGO's second neutron star merger, 190425. Um, the first one, as I mentioned before, was uh, right around here, smack dab in the middle of the galactic double neutron star distribution of masses. Uh, but this event had a substantially more massive uh, uh, total mass of the two neutron stars around 3.3 or something solar masses or even higher. Um, so this would have definitely been a prompt collapse given what we think we know about the TOB mass. Um, unfortunately, because only one LIGO detector was on, they couldn't do the usual triangulation and the error region on the sky was enormous. And so they didn't find any Kilonova counterpart uh, but I don't think they could rule out a 170817 luminosity event across this whole sky uh, region. Um, so we got a little unlucky this time, but even if we had been able to search the whole sky, the prediction is it would have been dimmer and harder to find. It was also further away. Um, so this just highlights how challenging this is, is going ahead uh, for future events. Um, what about more massive, uh, or sorry, less massive ingoing binary neutron stars that may produce these uh, long-lived stable objects? Well, the prediction here is if you look at the numerical relativity simulations, not only is this remnant rotating essentially at breakup, but the simulations predict that the magnetic field is amplified to some enormous strength inside of the remnant. And if that neutron star also has an external dipole component to its magnetic field, um, then you have a mechanism through the magnetic spin down of this object uh, to dump a bunch of energy into the environment uh, surrounding the source. In addition to what's ejected from the kilonova, now you're putting the millisecond magnetar in the middle of it. You can imagine that that magnetar spinning down might accelerate the ejecta, add additional energy to it, maybe make some uh, uh, non-thermal uh, radiation from a jet or something like that. So it could look completely different from, from these events. You might get brighter, faster, bluer kilonova and brighter X-ray and radio. And just to drive this point home, um, here I'm showing you this the same picture of outcomes. I just want to emphasize the energy hierarchy between these different outcomes of the merger. Basically, if you prompt collapse, the amount of kinetic energy you eject is quite small. If you go through a hypermassive neutron star, the amount of ejecta is, is greater, but it's still about 10 to the 51 ergs. Uh, if you produce one of these uh, supermassive or even indefinitely stable neutron stars, um, they have an enormous amount of rotational energy. Now, some of it could get lost to gravitational waves through secular instabilities and things after the merger, but, you know, you're talking about 10 to the 52 or 10 to the 53 uh, ergs of energy, which have to be released uh, in some form to facilitate collapse. Uh, and so, again, you, you know, if you have a magnetar wind going off inside this uh, kilonova ejecta, there could be a lot of different phenomenology. You could you could uh, get a long-lived jet in addition to the one that would normally be uh, short-lived surrounding the black hole. And the spin-down power of this magnetar uh, could greatly exceed the radioactive heating, so you could boost the luminosity of the kilonova. So my final slide um, is basically uh, my my sort of view of this of this field, um, and I and I I, I call it a, a Voigt Russell theorem for neutron star mergers. And it's essentially my viewpoint reading the numerical relativity literature is that total binary mass is the dominant variable that will control electromagnetic outcome. Um, and so in other words, um, you know, there should be a, a continuum of properties depending on the ingoing uh, chirp mass, we should be able to get these three or four different outcomes, a stable neutron star, a supermassive one, a hypermassive one, or a prompt collapse.
and and you know the amount of of kinetic energy and ejecta mass should vary and the colors of the kilonova should vary systematically across as a sort of one parameter uh family here um and so you know i think we would expect qualitative changes in the properties of the merger signatures uh, across these boundaries um and so you know, my view of this is that we will try to ascertain, we, LIGO will measure the chirp mass and, and tell us where we are in this axis. And we will try to ascertain from the electromagnetic counterpart, which of these outcomes we had. And then maybe we can define these boundaries where of course these boundaries depend on the equation of state. Maybe we can uh, start to put every event into its a category. And by building up over time, um, maybe we can, uh, test whether this picture is making sense. Uh, and if it's not, you know, that's telling us that that maybe the merger are missing some physics. Um, and, you know, the other thing I want to emphasize is that LIGO knows the chirp mass basically instantaneously. So there's no reason other than perhaps political that they couldn't tell astronomers right away, this was a high chirp mass event, it could be a prompt collapse. This is a low chirp mass event, it could be a supermassive neutron star. So I think going ahead, it's going to be important, uh, possibly, to prioritize our follow-up and the way we, uh, the way we go after these searches, uh, potentially based on this. Once we have enough to see if this situation makes any sense. Uh, anyways, yeah, this is what I just said. There's, you can call the matrix connecting GW and EM signatures, and the goal of multi-messenger astrophysics in this regard is to fill up this matrix with all the exciting possibilities. Um, so I'm basically finished. I just want to say. Um, you know, overall, I think this event, even though it was a surprise in many ways, I think a number of its features were anticipated by theory, which is exciting. There were uh, some things we, we, we didn't see and some things that we couldn't have seen. So um, here I'm showing you different phases of the merger, the in-spiral, the dynamical coalescence, the accretion phase, um, and then the remnant phase. Um, and the different signals, which vary from a gravitational wave chirp uh, to a gamma ray burst, uh, which is produced by the accreting black hole, to maybe a plateau of emission that could be produced by a long-lived magnetar. Uh, the ejection of material produces the R process about a second after the merger. And then different kinds of R process, we think, can power these different uh, colored uh, uh, blue and red kilonova. Um, you know, uh, and, and I think in, in most cases, uh, we saw these things. We saw gamma ray burst. We saw gravitational waves. We saw blue and a red kilonova. We saw radio emission as this material was from the, from the jet actually was interacting with the ISM. Uh, we hope to eventually see the kilonova interacting with the ISM. Um, we didn't see any extended X-ray emission, which is maybe suggestive that there wasn't a long-lived magnetar in this, in this event. Uh, well, there's some hints maybe of a flare, but that was pretty, pretty uh, marginal. Um, and we also didn't see, uh, there's two things that I hope we can see in the future. One is, um, was there any type of radio or x-ray precursor to the merger? Um, we, we didn't have any radio or x-ray telescopes pointed that direction uh, at the time, so we can't tell. But I've been working on theories which predict that maybe there could be a fast radio burst which proceeds by a few milliseconds to merger. So it'd be very exciting uh, to test that in the future. And the other thing is that um, the very fir first few hours, um, because this event happened over the Indian Ocean, we had to wait, wait for the Earth to rotate uh, before it was over South America, which is where all the big telescopes were, could find it. Um, it would have been, if it had happened over North America we, and it was nighttime, um, you know, we, 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 or over South America, we could have looked right away um, and, and so there are some predictions that the emission from the kilonova could be much bluer uh, and brighter in the first few hours because the outermost layers of the ejecta, they could contain free neutrons instead of our process elements. And the heating from those free neutrons is pretty intense in those first uh, hour. Um, so so there, there, there's a possibility of another signature of the fastest material, which may actually freeze out of the R process. But anyways, that's for the future. Um, I will stop there and, and take your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Then we start with the questions. Please, Danny. Uh, 
Hi, Brian. B very nice talk. Thank you very much. I, I have one question. When you say that if you have a neutron star remnant, it's emit neutrinos, which are going to, trans to transform neutrons into proton in the accretion torus. But the neutron star will also emit anti-neutrino, which will transform proton into neutrons. So why is, is it damaging? Um, so an equal, as you, as you know, yeah, an equal flux of the two will tend to drive the YE to about a half, right? If they both have the same flux and the same neutrino energies. So to get uh -huh. the R process, we need to preserve a YE less than about 0.25 in the outflows. So you're right. The neutrinos try to drive the outflows to rough parity. I mean, there's, there's a slight, I mean, maybe, maybe they, maybe they try, depending on the relative ratio, maybe they try to drive it to, to 0.4 or something, but, but, um, but to get the heaviest R process, you have to keep YE less than 0.25. Um, so, so you're right. They're both irradiating, but the net effect is to drive it higher than, than um, what you need for the heaviest one elements, which is the, which is the problem in proto neutron star winds, right? Uh, you know, that's the problem um, uh, in, in how to get uh, proto neutron star winds to be our process sources is the neutrinos tend to drive YE too high. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Enrique, please. Hi. Talk, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, so probably it's uh, slightly related to what Danny was. Uh, I want to give it a, a slightly different focus. So yes, in order to produce all these new, all these neutrinos, you're assuming that uh, I guess the proton neutron star is cooling, and that's your main source. But uh, if you were to form a black hole, I assume it would be a rapidly spinning black hole. You have all these mechanisms to produce very large magnetic fields. And then you could also activate something like Blanford's Nyack, or I forget right now the, the other last name, Blanford uh, Payne. I think it is the one where you have uh, energy from the disk. And wouldn't you also have a source to produce a lot of uh, neutrinos as well? And then it would make it murkier or harder to, to understand what's the, the source of all of these neutrinos, even if you had an early collapse to a black hole? Yeah, Thanks. no, it, it, it's a very good point. Um, the disk is producing a strong source of neutrinos. It's not as strong as the, the neutron star, um, but it depends on the accretion rate. And so what happens, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of recent work, um, there's a recent work by Jonah Miller looking at this with like full Monte Carlo rated of transport with the neutrinos. And, and they find for high accretion rates, it's true, even the neutrinos, from the disk itself, no neutron star in the middle uh, can raise the electron fraction high enough that uh, you may not get the heaviest elements. Um, however, uh, as the disk evolves pretty quickly, you know, below that accretion rate, and I, and I think once the uh, accretion rate, you know, most of the mass ejection doesn't happen at the very highest accretion rate. It happens a little bit later when the disk has spread a little bit. Um, and so at those lower accretion rates where a lot of the mass is coming off of the disk, the neutrinos from the disk, I don't think are strong enough relative to what you would have if you had a neutron star in the middle. Um, but it, it is true that the calculations we've done that I showed, these sort of pioneering calculations well before this was something people were really uh, worried about, uh, did a very crude job on the neutrino transport. We had a sort of a leakage scheme and a, and a light bulb in the middle and some opacity to reduce the light, you know, so as opposed to, you know, Monte Carlo or even, you know, uh, M1 scheme. So, so I think, uh, I think this is going to be a, a, this is the new direction is to see, is to take this concept. I think that the, the qualitative trend, I was being very unspecific in, in what I was saying, because I think the qualitative trend will be preserved. If, if the neutron star survives for seconds, I think that will produce a very different outflow than if, if a black hole is the only thing present. But, but I think that the detail, like, exactly where we put that cutoff and say, okay, I can eliminate a remnant that survives for 200 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds. I think, you know, we're, that's going to require these more sophisticated uh, simulations. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it, it goes in the right direction. Okay. Hey, Gloria, please. Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. I'm Gloria Koenigsberger. Thanks for the talk. Thank uh, you. 
I, uh, I was curious about uh, something here regarding the InSpiral. The simulation you showed seems to indicate that during the InSpiral, the two neutron stars are tidally locked. But then this would imply that you have a really strong viscosity source or mechanism by which you can redistribute rapidly enough the angular momentum and get them to be rigidly rotating and synchronized. So that, that was my first question. What is the source of viscosity at that, at that stage? And then the second, the second question is, I, I, I did see that once they have merged, there is a model that contemplates differential rotation. Um, so again, there the question would be, what's, uh, what's the viscosity source and how, how, what, what kind of difference does it make whether it's rigidly rotating or differentially rotating? A very good question, thank you. Um, so, I don't, I, I, I don't remember what the assumptions are in the simulation I showed, because I didn't, I didn't run it myself. I'm not sure they were, I mean, they appear to be tidally locked, but it could also be that the tidal bulge is moving with the, with the binary. So I, I don't know what the, I, the usual belief is that viscosity is not, um, uh, is not strong enough to enforce uh, co-rotation. Mm -hmm. co I believe that there is an old famous paper by Cutler and Bildston showing that Basically, viscosity would have to be super liminal to bring the stars into co-rotation. Although I know there's some, there is some work on on tides from Navin Weinberg looking at G modes and things that are excited uh, and what those effects would. I, I don't know. I'm not sure about the viscosity before the merger, um, um, so I can't answer on that one very very astutely. I will say, in the post-merger remnant, it's it's very unclear. I think it's unlikely that it can be a, a microscopic viscosity. I mean. The time scales that are involved here um, are probably very, very too short. But um, uh, the outer layers, so, 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 yeah, the merger produces an object which is rotating faster on the outer layers and slower in the center. Um, and so there's a shear profile that's that's rise, rising, and then uh, omega is rising with radius and then dropping. Um, so the outer parts, uh, you know, they're unstable to the magnetorotational instability, and so one can invoke MRI turbulence uh, as, as a source of viscosity uh, in the outer parts of the object. In the inner parts, it's where you have a, your, your, rota your omega is rising, you're stable to the MRI, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty as to what that viscosity source is. Uh, neutrino viscosity, as crazy as it sounds, could be relevant because the neutrino mean free path here is not microscopic. Um, I think there's other things people haven't explored yet. Um, there are these... Um, Sprite Taylor uh, instabilities where you wind up a, a magnetic field um, and eventually get so strong that it becomes unstable to to uh, to this uh, kink instability essentially and, and so I, I don't know there, there 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 has to be more work on this. What I'll tell you is that pe that that the source of viscosity in most of the simulations um, is numerical, <laughs> so it's not physical. Mm -hmm. It's just that the numerical grid. Uh, so you can literally see this where they increase the resolution and the object will survive longer because the viscosity in their, on their computer grid is weaker. Um, so I think there needs to be more thought as to what the source in the middle of, the, of this object where it's not MRI unstable uh, is. Uh, I think some ideas from stellar evolution theory may be helpful to them, but, um, but it, it's true, it's an important problem. Um, and, and so, you know, so, so, the, so the issue with, so, so, uh, so, so, so a differentially rotating star in principle can have a higher mass, um, higher stable mass than a solid body rotating star, depending on how you redistribute the angular momentum. So that's, that's sort of the key is that this object starts off, um, you know, it, it, that's what, that's what's, that's what I'm saying it. So, so if, if the mass, if, if the mass of the ingoing object is very, is, is, is fairly low, and so the object is pretty stable, um, then, you, you know, it could come into solid body state and it would still be stable if it's rotating fast enough. Uh, that's a supermassive neutron star. But if it's more massive, um, you know, in the process of going from this differentially rotating object, it's trying, it wants to come to a solid body state because that's the minimum energy state, right, uh, mm -hmm. for a given amount of angular momentum. Uh, but in the process of, 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 of going into a solid body state, it, it becomes, you know, destabilized uh, 
uh, because you're 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 moving in momentum out, you know, into a disk or something, and mass is accreting into the object. So 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 uh, so that's what most of the simulations see is 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 a collapse, you know, before you get to this this solid body state. Um, uh, but yeah, anyways, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Yes, thank you. The only thing that I still don't understand is to have the MRI instability, you need charged particles. So this assumes that on the surface of the neutron star, you already have a large number of non of, of particles other than neutrons. Yeah, they, they're, they're, there are protons as well uh, and electrons. It's just the neutrons dominate, but but in these objects, they, they do have protons and electrons. Um, so there, I think there, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with having enough, uh, yeah, enough charged particles. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you.